There are times throughout the Bible when God reveals himself as commander of the chaos. Commander of the darkness. Commander over evil. Commander means one with higher authority who knows how to use it and will use it to bring order. A commander is a higher authority who leads forces to vanquish a foe, like a general, like General George Washington or General Eisenhower or General Patton. They were commanders. Commanders lead their troops to victory. Commanders bring about and implement strategies of change. Commanders use force at any and all levels to set captives free or liberate a territory or a nation from an occupying force. A commander is empowered to bring liberty and freedom to those who are oppressed. God reveals himself quite often as commander of the chaos, controller of the wind, controller of the seas. He's the one who, when the earth was completely covered by water, stood where there are now beaches and the land begins. He's the one who stood there and commanded the seas, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Mediterranean, the Gulf of Mexico. You can only come this far. And that's as far as they came. Commander of the seas, commander of the wind, commander of the darkness, commander over evil, commander over the crisis. I want to use today the book of Esther to highlight some of this. And I want to use it to highlight some unique parallels to our times right now in America and this world. It is a book about God's people facing horrific, chaotic, dark, evil messes and a government of tyranny. So let's go back to 400, to 483 BC to the Persian Empire uh, and it's 127 provinces that led the, the then world. The people of God were in captivity. And they were a people in that Persian Empire that were absolutely despised. They were hated. It all came to a head when a man named Haman, the highest ranking person in the nation, except for King Ahasuerus, who is mostly referred to as Xerxes, same person, Ahasuerus or Xerxes, same king. But Haman de developed a horrible plan to eradicate God's people. And he came to King Xerxes with that plan. Esther 3, 8 begins to tell us this. Haman then spoke with King Xerxes. There is an odd set of people scattered through the provinces of your kingdom who don't fit in. Their customs and their ways are different from those of everybody else. They don't conform. Worse, they disregard the king's law. That is... They consider their God's law higher than their nation's law. They're an affront. The king shouldn't put up with them. If it please the king, let orders be given that, that they be destroyed. I'll pay for it myself. I'll deposit 375 tons of silver in the royal bank to finance the operation. I'm a billionaire. I'll fund it myself. The king slipped 
his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of, uh, son of Hamedatha, the Agachite, arch enemy, arch enemy of the Jews. Can you imagine that? There was actually a government, a government leader that was an arch enemy to God's people. Who'd have thought it? Go ahead, the king said to Haman. It's your money. Do whatever you want with those people. The Bible alerts us to understand his people can have arch enemies in government. The highest, politi the highest politician in the land, except for the king, Haman, a politician who led the largest contingency of activists in his time, said, there's people who are deplorable in the land. They're odd, and they won't bow to me. Remember, that was what a lot of the book of Esther was about. The people of God would not bow to Haman. And uh, they were, it was a law that they should, especially Mordecai, who becomes a very key figure in the book. He wouldn't bow, and Haman hated him for it. And he said, they, they, they honor God's law over our nation's law. The dogma lives deep in them. They cling to their God and their guns and their faith, they're an affront. They need to be destroyed. They need to be eradicated from the nation. They're ruining things. They're ruining our adultery of Baal worship and the sacrificing of babies. They want to expose our corruption and misuse of kingdom treasure. They must go. Well, the plan came together, and an evil law was passed. Esther 3, verse 13, begins this way. Bulletins were sent out by couriers to all the king's provinces with orders to massacre, kill and eliminate all the Jews, youngsters and old men. That ticks me off. women and babies. On a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and plunder their goods. Copies of the bulletin were to be posted in each province, public, publicly available to all peoples to get them ready for that day. And the king's command, or at the king's command, the couriers took off the order was also posted in the palace complex of Susa. And Haman sat back and had a drink while the city of Susa reeled from the news. It seems as if those godless politicians attempting to control God's people, attempting to control the church, don't meet together. Don't sing, don't worship. Especially in California, we are seeing it. There are churches that are in trouble now. There are thousands of dollars uh, behind in fines. And pastors are being jailed for their stand. Churches are closing down. They're about to go under. Don't, don't worship. It seems as if those politicians in our times are kicking back at night, having a drink, and sleeping in their pride and arrogance. But they are forgetting the supreme commander is watching. The supreme commander of the chaos is watching. Well, what in the world were they, were they to do? What? What, what were God's people to do? They were just a tiny little remnant. And the situation was dire. I mean, to say the least, it was dire. It looked absolutely hopeless. And no one knew as yet, commander of the chaos had a plan. 
No one knew that he, he wasn't taken off guard by any of this. And we see that, that in times like this, God has a remnant people that he prepares to help him change history. He begins to raise up history makers, history changers. God brings forth people for certain occasions. He has always done that all throughout history. They are born. They are born to change things. There was this young Jewish girl, and her name was Hadassah, otherwise known as Esther. She had been through a horrible tragedy her own right. Her parents had passed away when she was very young. We don't know how. We don't know what happened. We just know that her parents had passed away. But commander over dark times had come to her. And he had come through for her, turning things for her good, turning her mourning into dancing, turning her life around and healing her emotions. We know she was healed because of her very mature reactions or actions uh, later on in her life. Her uncle, Mordecai, adopted her, and we are simply told Mordecai loved her, and he loved her as his own daughter. Mordecai was one of the brilliant young men that had been taken captive from Jerusalem uh, uh, along with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and a lot of other young men of noble birth. And Mordecai worked as a servant in the palace of Xerxes. Well, those who were captured and forced to serve in the Persian government had developed a a way of secretly communicating among themselves about what was going on. They had a, a, an underground type network that they could get information quickly around. In brief, here's what happened. King Xerxes' queen, a woman named Vasti, had rebelled against him publicly. And she wouldn't stop, and she was causing quite a scandal. And when she, was, when she was confronted about it, she became even more uh, rebellious. And she pictures in Scripture an, a, another Jezebel, actually. And in anger, Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, he banned her from ever seeing him again. And he took from her her position as being queen he took it away forever and he decided that that in one year's time he would have a beauty contest and whoever won the beauty contest would then become the queen well the Jews the people of God who had been taken captive they saw a chance to get into government at least get in there somehow and begin to influence it some way and and Mordecai enters Esther into the beauty pageant. We are told she was drop dead gorgeous. Not quite that, but Esther 2.7 says she had a good figure and a beautiful face. That usually does it, you know. And for six months, they soaked her in myrrh and then the following six months, they, they soaked her in expensive perfumes and various cosmetics, chapter 2, verse 12 says, which of course was the picture of the anointing oil. In other words, essentially, they anointed her every day for one year's time. And by the end of that year, her whole being smelled of expensive perfumes, so much so that, that when it was time for her to be brought before King Xerxes, Esther's 2.15 2 says, they applied nothing. They didn't need to. She needed nothing. Who she was, was enough. And again, 
The story in brief is when she was brought in, the king fell in love at first sight. Hadassah, anointed with favor, became the queen. And they kept it quiet concerning the fact that she was a Jew. She was one of the deplorables. Commander of the chaos was beginning his plan. That's the background that, that is important to know when you get to the evil plot of Haman just a few years later to kill all the Jews you wanted to, to kill the kids, to, to, to kill the babies, to confiscate the property of God's people, to take their businesses away from them and transfer their wealth to them. They, they, they don't fit among us. They're odd people. Eradicate them. Well, the secret communication system of God's captive people that were serving in the palace lit up when this decree was signed, when, when this law was signed. And Mordecai hears about it. He hears that the evil law has been passed. He dressed himself in sackcloth and he put ashes on his head, which is in those days was a sign of grieving, deep grieving. And he began to weep bitter tears and he begins to walk towards the king's gate. When he gets to the king's gate, he stands outside of it dressed in sackcloth. He has ashes and he's crying at the king's gate. And Esther's maids saw him. And they ran to tell Esther, who was stunned at the news. She sent her servant with a change of clothes for Mordecai, saying, you must not be seen like this. Please change your clothes and please talk to me. But you can... Feel the sense of foreboding that was hanging over those people. Clearly, it was time to reveal she and Mordecai were Jews. She sends a message to Mordecai, the man who had raised her, and it says she would do anything for him. She was dad to him. She sent a message saying, what are we going to do? If I go to the king, it is forbidden. If I go to the king, the law says, I will be killed instantly by the guards unless he intervenes. Mordecai sent this reply back to Esther. Esther 4, verse 13. Mordecai sent her this message. Don't think that just because you live in the king's house, you're the one Jew who will get out of this alive. If you persist in staying silent at a time like this, help and deliverance will arise from the Jews from someplace else, but you and your family will be wiped out. Who knows? Maybe you were made queen for just such a time as this. Esther sent back her answer to Mordecai. Go and get all the Jews living in Shusa together and, and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, either day or night. I and my maids will fast with you. If you will do this, I will go to the king, even though it's forbidden. If I die, I die. I mean, let that sink in. She knew it could happen. She knew she could die. She knew in three days life could end for her. But she said, I'll do it. I'll go. The Amplified Bible, Esther 4, 14 says, For if you keep silent at a time like this, Mordecai, I said, relief and deliverance shall rise for the Jews from elsewhere, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows? But what you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this and for this very occasion. Again, God 
brings forth people for certain occasions. They're born to change certain times. Queen Esther faced a decision that I believe the people of God are facing right now. Would she dare stand and uncover evil in her nation or keep quiet? Would she get involved in the political debate of her times? The defining moment of her times, the harm and persecution of people because of their faith. The plunder and the confiscation of their wealth. The wealth transfer to godless agendas. That law had already been passed. It was, it was the law of the land. How would she respond? How will we respond? What, what would she do? Would she get involved? Would, would she say something or hide her true identity, would, would the reason she was saturated in anointing be hidden or not hidden? Would she go to the king and expose the evil gen, agenda of political opportunists led by Haman, Haman or not? Would she? Thankfully, we know she did not shrink back she didn't shrink back in fear. She got, she got involved. Hear this. The anointed bride went to the king's throne room. What a picture that is. The anointed bride must go to the king's throne room and make the request. When she came in, there was a gasp in the room from royal officials. The guards reacted, pulling their swords, but King ah Ahasuerus acted quickly and stayed her execution. He extended towards her the golden scepter and said, what can I do for you? Up to the half of my kingdom, what do you want? Why are you here? And she came forward, it says, and she touched the golden scepter of the king, representing, of course, his authority, symbolizing, if you extend your governing authority to me, I accept. And she told him what Haman's plan, his wicked plot was. She said, why are you allowing, why are you allowing me to be killed? Why are you allowing... Mordecai, who saved you from assassination just a few years ago. Why are you allowing him to be killed? And, and the king was appalled. He was livid. And he said, what are you talking about? Who would dare do such a thing? Tell me, who is it? And her beautiful, manicured hand stretched forward and pointed at Haman. He has tricked you into signing an evil law. I I am a Jew. I serve Jehovah God, and Yahweh is the only one I'll bow to. Mm. The king checked his sources, found out she's telling us, she's telling the truth, and he issued a, a, another decree. He issued a decree hang Haman on the gallows that he has built 75 feet high. To hang Mordecai on, hang him on the gallows he built for Mordecai. Also, he said, hang his ten sons on it as well. Also, he said, give all of his wealth to Esther. Transfer his wealth to my bride. That is another sermon. Then he gave authority to Mordecai to rewrite the evil law so no harm would come to God's people. So amazingly, commander of the chaos, commander of the evil, had a plan to change things and bring order to an absolute mess in that nation. He had a plan, 
that had started years and years before to change things. God is revealed as commander of the chaos throughout history. In the beginning, the earth was a vast chaotic mass, we are told. It's just a, a dark mud ball. But the supreme commander brought order and magnificent beauty to creation. When God's people were in a time of great poverty and oppression by the, the Midianites, for seven straight years, all of their harvests were stolen from them. They would raid at harvest time and steal Israel's harvest. And it says the people of God were greatly impoverished because of it. The people were starving. But finally Gideon, a young man, decided he was here for such an occasion as this. And he found a remnant of 300 others who felt the same way. It's our time to stop this. It's our time to stop the pillage and, and, the, and the, the raiding. We were born for this occasion. We were born for such a time as this. And commander over the chaos, commander over the ruin and the loss, he stepped in and he released a plan, enabling them to get all their lost harvest back and the spoil left over. It was miraculous. When King Saul, under King Saul's leadership, Israel got into a real mess. God's people found themselves oppressed. They, they lived in fear. Saul, their government leader, was a bully. And worse, he was polluting God's ways, attempting to usurp the prophetic and the priestly ministry uh, of the nation. He was leading that nation in rebellion against God. The, the prophet Samuel was beside himself in righteous indignation. Just as many in our times find themselves like that. They're beside themselves in righteous indignation. But what, what do we do? That's when commander over dark times gave Samuel understanding. I have a plan. No one else even knows about this plan. There's a young kid, one of, one of Jesse's sons, who was born for just this occasion. He was born for such a time as this. Go and pour the anointing oil over David. Soak him in it. It's time for him to rise in authority. David himself he came to know commander of the dark times quite well, going through deep, dark nights of the soul himself. He went through times of deep discouragement. He went through times of deep disappointment, times of loneliness, times of hunger, times of fear, family traumas like losing an infant son, family traumas like one of his sons betraying him, Absalom. Times of hiding in a cave from, from his enemy seeking to, to kill him. But, but God, the commander of the dark times, the, the commander over the evil dark times, always came through for him. His classic showdown with Goliath reveals his confidence in the supreme commander as he stared into the eyes of that defying giant. And he says essentially to, to, to Goliath, I was born for this occasion. I was born for such a time as this. I was born to cut your head off. I have been raised up to take you down. And with a slingshot, he did it. The book of Esther, written, we believe, by Mordecai himself, it cannot be more clear to intervene, to be involved in a very dark time. Oh, that's why Esther was born. It was actually a part of her destiny. She was born 
for that very occasion. There are millions of Christians living all over our world today. And Esther's question is theirs to answer. Why are you here? You, you could have been born at any other time of history. Why now? Why here and now? You must know that. Obviously, God wanted you here and now. Because God ordains our time and place. Acts 17, 26 says, You're here now because God wants you here now. He ordained it. You're here for now. And one of those reasons, I believe, is so you can make a stand for reformation like Esther made a stand for reformation in her nation. You most certainly were not put here now to be silent and passive. You were, you were not born to do nothing. You were born to stand with Christ's church. You were born to stand with his amazing ecclesia and see revival and see reformation in our world. You, you are here to change a nation. What we see happening all around us is actually a part of your destiny. That you're here to help change. You're here to work promoting laws that free rather than burden. You're here to make a stand for God and His ways. You're here to speak up for Christ Jesus. You're here to be one of the ones that is a watchman on the wall, a guardian of America's walls like Ezekiel was. Praying, obeying, and warning of potential judgment if God continues to be mocked. You are here to be a part of His church, His ecclesia. For such a time as this, you're here to be a part of his bride, the bride of Christ. Holy Spirit's been soaking that bride in anointing for years now. Preparing her to come into the king's throne room and make a request to, to preparing her to come to the to the king's throne room and say what she wants, confess or declare her desires and ask for help in the time of need. Commander of the chaos has been planning for this time, establishing a true ecclesia that is to come boldly to the throne of grace and see history changed. See him today. Extending his golden, golden scepter to his ecclesia, his bride saying, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? He has prepared us. Prepared us to stand against high-ranking politicians of evil. Commander of dark times has been preparing the bride to change evil laws. And yes... We honor God's law over man's law. And yes, the dogma lives deep in us. And no, we will not stay silent at such an occasion as this. Yes, we are anointed to stand against God's people being harmed, persecuted, imprisoned, or destroyed. Yes, we are anointed to stop the baby killing. Yes, we have been soaked in Holy Spirit anointing to stop the wealth transfer to evil causes. Yes, we are anointed as the king's bride to stop the confiscation of God's people's property, businesses, or church buildings. Yes, we have been anointed to face giants to declare the bold authority that the king has extended uh, towards us. We have been raised up to take giants down. Commander, the chaos has a plan to change history, but it involves us, his bride. 
He knows how to command order to the mess in this nation, but it involves his bride. He knows how to bring order in the government, but it requires the involvement of his bride. He knows how to bring order in the court, but it requires his bride. He knows how to lead us to vanquish foes and see the efforts of Haman reversed. He, he knows how to hang the efforts of Antichrist agendas, arch enemies of the people of God, on gallows they've built for us. But it requires the involvement of his bride. Like Mordecai and Esther, God's righteous remnant, his bride, has grieved over this nation. I know I have. I've never pushed harder in my life. I feel it every day. I feel the weight of it. I feel the weight of the oppression of Antichrist dark agendas, harming people and polluting our nation with demon doctrines. God's righteous remnant has grieved over this nation. And I suppose we have felt the sense of foreboding as well. And it has become clear if we persist in staying silent at a time like this, our way of life could be wiped out. No, we cannot be silent on occasions like this. Mm -mm. And thankfully, God brings forth people to answer the occasion. He always has, and He will now, and we are now beginning to see it happen. People we didn't know. People that have been hidden in the, in the woodwork and they're now being brought forward for such a time as this. They, they are born to change the times. I believe I was born. I was born for this time. I feel that. I believe you were. We all were. Why? Because you have breath now. You're here now because he wants you now. You're not here by accident. You're not here because a pill failed. God could have had you in the dark ages. He could have had you in the old wild west. He said, there's something in them I need right here, right now, to become a part of my bride that will go and make a stand. You... You have a part in this. And it's time to partner with commander of the chaos, trusting his plan and bring order into the land. Also, to be that person of destiny as Esther was and as David was, we must pause just a second because perhaps you need supreme commander to heal some dark times in you. It's a fact of life. You won't get through it without some dark times. You don't get through it without some wounds, even if you're the bride. Esther pictures it clearly. King David pictures it clearly. No one gets through life unscathed. We all face challenges. Sometimes they are severe. Often they are not fair. Sometimes they're oppressive. And sometimes they weigh our souls down. And perhaps you need supreme commander of dark times to heal you today. Hmm. The good news is he's still supreme commander of the dark times. He's still supreme commander of the chaos. He's still the commander over trauma. He can turn it around for good just like he did Esther and reveal. You have destiny and purpose ordained for you right now.
So no matter what your, your situation might be, no matter how dark, no matter how bad, no matter how complicated, the supreme commander can lead you through it. That's a part of this time. He's anointing his bride to be healed, to rise, to come to the throne room and change history. It's time to partner with him like we've never done before and push, activating why we're here. Singers and musicians, please come. I was born for such a time as this. What an awesome thought. The anointing that's been being poured out for over a decade now in an apostolic and prophetic era has been soaking us to, as a bride, go into the presence of the king. And I believe that's, that's what is now called for in our nation. Can we or will we as his bride go in and make our voice known? Will you make your voice known? Father, today we're approaching, a, we're approaching on the timeline of history an occasion, Lord, like few times in history and maybe no times in, in my life, like in my lifetime. Without being overly dramatic, Lord, millions, millions hang in the balance of these next two and a half weeks. May your bride be found in the throne room requesting help requesting grace to help us requesting a plan that you have to unfold free people change things God all over this nation in every state may your bride arise and, and use the anointing you've soaked her in for such an occasion as this may the bride be seen may it be seen with such courage the courage of a David that would stand and face a Goliath the courage of an Esther who said, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die, but I will. I will go to the king. I will reveal the purpose of the anointing that is on me. The governing authority I've been soaked in, I'll reveal it. This is my occasion. Let the occasion you've brought us to, Lord, let the church's occasion rise and be so clearly seen, Lord. That changes everything. She changed it all. The bride changed everything. The bride changed everything. The bride's stand changed everything. 